Hi, I'm Shaka Hislow from ESPN and you're watching Football 101 on Axe 25. Welcome Trinidad and Tobago to this week's episode of Football 101 right here on Axe Television Network, your local football talk show that highlights all the happenings of football around the world. I'm your host Joshua DeMatos and alongside me is Central's FC sports analyst and the one and only Inter Milan fan in Trinidad and Tobago, <laughs> Andre Sukla. Yes, yes, I'm the one and only fan, but eventually I'll get a second one, maybe Shaka and Joshua when we're done. Well, I'll be three. Maybe, yeah. maybe at the end of the show we'll see yeah. what goes on. Mm. Well, on this week's episode of Football 1-1, we have the privilege of interviewing a living legend, a former Trinidad and Tobago footballer who was a part of the 2006 World Cup team who spent 15 years of his playing career in England's top division and is currently a sports analyst for ESPN FC TV. And this, I mean, he needs no introduction. A legend in our game, Shaka Hislop. Shaka, it's really an honor to have you right here on, on Football 101. I must say. Thanks, guys. It's my pleasure. It really is. Yes, we had Shaka a while ago, probably about two years back, when you know the show now started off. We had a little interview with him at one of the local um, clothing stores, and you know it's really nice to have him back two years later. And you know he's still as humble as he was back then, willing to be on the show with us, Shaka. Again, thank you for for spending this time with us. You're welcome. All right, Shaka. So you know we're gonna roll straight into the questions. Um, okay. As a youngster. You know, was football you, you know, the only sport that you, you really liked? Was it just football or was it uh, other sports? No, I played cricket as well growing up. I mean, of course, um, you know, at the time, our, our calendar was split into, into two seasons, football season and cricket season. Growing up, you played both, um, which, is, which is what I did. I played my football well, anywhere I could. I played my cricket with Harvard Cricket Club, which my father was a member. Um, but then, you know, it came a point at a point 15 or 16, where, where you had to, where I, I had to choose what to, to take seriously, and and I was better at football. I preferred football. I stayed, still played cricket, but more from a class team at, at St Mary's College than, than anything um, anything more than that. I, mean, I think I played up to about under 16 for for uh, St Mary's as well, um, but nothing more than that. And um, yeah, but football was still still my focus. Oh, okay. Well, as a footballer in St. Mary's College, and then we, we know that you got a scholarship to go away to Howard's University. So how was that transition from moving from uh, some, a school footballer in the, in, in the college leagues in Trinidad to going to America in a, in a bigger league like that? It, it, um, well, it was what everybody did at, at the time. At the time, I, I, left, I, I graduated from, from CIC in, in 87 after doing my A-levels. There was no there was no pro league, there was no MLS. Um, okay. as, a, as a young player coming up through the game, you had a choice, either you stay in Trinidad and, and um, you know, play club football, which is amateur pretty much throughout in, in, in Trinidad, or you, you pursue a, a university degree. Um, you know, I, I had decent, well, both O and A level passes, and that seemed the most logical path for me you know the intention was always just to get a degree um, and find a job and uh, with that professional qualification uh, which is what I did uh, when I went up to, to the States in, in 87 uh, I got injured in, in the pre-season um, so I was what they call red shirted okay just kind of meaning uh, they'd still pay my scholarship I was in a half scholarship at the time mm -hmm. um, but I'd sit out the year because you only allowed four years eligibility in, in the NCAAs. Okay. So I'd sit down my first year and then have, have another four years of, uh, of university and of, of playing time um, with, with Howard, which, okay. is, which is what I did. From that point, I mean, a lot of people don't know this. They don't know that you, you know, the average fan doesn't know that in addition to your sporting career, you have a degree. Mm -hmm. um, just to clarify, uh, the degree is in, is it in mechanical engineering, if I'm correct? Is yeah, it? well, I now have a couple of degrees. Uh, um, uh, I had a Bachelor of Science in, in Mechanical Engineering, which I graduated with in, in 92. 
And a couple of years ago, I went back to school and, and completed an executive MBA also, also at Howard. Wow, very impressive. Okay. As my dad would say, when people have a bunch of degrees, you say you have more degrees than a thermometer, which I don't laugh at. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I have too many degrees. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but um, that is also very good. A lot of sport, I'm in the sport field as well, and a lot of students don't know it's okay to pursue academics as well as sport once you balance your time. Yeah. So that is a good role model. And, and, I mean, it's, it's kind of how I was brought up um, in sport. Yeah. My dad was was a, a very good cricketer and, and athlete himself. He eventually went on to to become a lawyer or graduate in law school in England, um, which is how come I managed to be born in England because my father was a uh, was completing law so his law degree in in in, in London at the time. Okay. Um, and he always felt and always said to me, and I keep saying, I don't know if this is true, but it certainly worked for me. Um, when things were going well on the field, things would go well in the club classroom and, and vice versa. Um, so I, it, it was important to me that to, to have a, a balance of the two uh, because if, if my classes weren't going well, it would, it would show itself on the football field. So I've, I've always um, been quite careful in, um, in, in making sure that as much as I committed to, to football, um, I, I had to, had to commit just as much and, and show as much um, dedication to, to my studies. Okay, so after graduating from Howard University, how, was that, how did you actually get, even though you were a footballer in the university and then um, all of a sudden this contract with Reading came along, how, how did that transition take place? Well, it was, um, it, it, I, I can't say it was with any type of design. Um, I graduated and knew that I wanted to give professional football a, a shot. I wasn't quite sure how I was, how I was going to do that. Mm -hmm. um, again, you know, I graduated from Howard in, in 1992. There yeah. was no MLS at the time. Yeah. Um, so I had, a, I had a British passport because I was born there, as, as I just mentioned. So I was going to chance my arm. But at the same time, I had a, I had a degree. I had offers to go back to school to, to complete a master's in engineering. Um, but I wanted to give it a shot. Um, as it happens, and as fortune would, would have it, I was drafted by the Baltimore Blast, um, an indoor team. There was an indoor professional league in the U.S. at the time. I was drafted by the by the Blast. Mm -hmm. I, I had no intention of in indoor football at all, mm -hmm. um, which I, I, I told them up front. But they were making a tour of England, and as it happened again, okay. they, were, they were playing two exhibition games against Aston Villa. Okay. Dwight York had just signed for Aston Villa a year or two previously. Okay. Um, so I... I Went with the blast, and again things just kind of fall into place. But the blast regular goalkeeper was Puerto Rico, and he got called into the Puerto Rico national team, so he couldn't make the trip. So I was the only goalkeeper with this professional outfit playing indoor. I'd never played indoor before. Mm -hmm. uh, when they got mad in match in in in. in I can't remember if I played both games, but I still remember I played one. Got my match in, in that game, um, and a Reading scout just happened to be in the stands, spotted me, they offered me a trial, and um, the rest of this is history. Hmm. Well, that's like a fairy tale story. Yeah, it does. Right? It does sound like one of those movies. Yeah. And he was discovered by a guy <laughs> yes. in the crowd. It, it is. And when I look back, and, and even now when I talk about my career, how things came to pass, um, and the directions it continues to, to take, it, it does have a, a, a fairy tale feel to it, even even to me. I, I hope I don't come across as arrogant in, in saying that. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe sentimental as you would, I would use. Yeah. <laughs> how, how long did you stay at, at Reading Football Club? I was at Reading for three years, 92 through 95. Okay, and then moving from Reading to an even bigger club, Newcastle United, a four-time EPL winner, six-time FA Cup champions, um, from a club like Reading, then going into the, the Premiership, how was that? How was that? Well, that was a big jump. It, it threw up challenges to me that you know I never experienced before and didn't expect. You know, at Reading, you play football, you enjoy it. People kind of accept your mistakes yeah. and move on. Yeah. Um, you know, I think one of the big lessons I learned in playing for Reading and under Mark McGee was, um, you know. He, he wanted me to do certain things. Uh, uh, for instance, he would say to me, you know, come for every single cross. He's like, 
you'll get there six times great you um we'll we we'll clear three of the line and and then one will one will go in mm -hmm. um so one out of ten will go in and you'll have to take the blame for it um <laughs> on the other hand if you don't come for those 10 crosses they'll probably end up scoring four hmm. so you know you, you're, you were allowed to to do that to make those mistakes to take those chances purely in a numbers game and you weren't criticized for it mm -hmm. and then the big difference of playing in the premier league is every mistake you know people Criticize. people don't remember what else goes on yeah so all of a sudden you know you're coming for those same 10 crosses you, you're doing the same exact numbers you did at reading mm -hmm. but because one goes into the back of the net all of a sudden um there are calls for your head he needs to be dropped you, you, the criticism is scathing and then uh, in the national press and, and it takes its toll mm -hmm. it really does take its toll yeah. so mentally as you say as you said that it takes its toll mentally transitioning from you know a guy from Trinidad goes to the US and all of a sudden you know in front of the Newcastle crowd you know as you said you know any mistake is you know you're torn apart basically you know yeah. um, what was it like was it easy for you to transition or you know some people from what I heard don't have it that you know they don't do it as well as what you did but we are we are fans from the outside looking in so what was it like for you it, it was tough I have to admit it, it, there, there were their challenges I mean no, no different to Reading um, my first year at Reading Football Club, uh, I maintained this. I signed a two-year deal when I first when I first went to Reading. Had I not signed two years, if I'd only signed for one, I, I would have packed in at the end of the first year. It, it, it was tough. It, it really was. Um, but I wanted to honour my I wanted to honour my contract. I had two years. I had to see it out. I spoke long and hard with my father about about it. I remember at the end of my first year, it was been in the summer of of 93 um we went to toko my dad and i he was a magistrate serving up in toko um he, he was serving in, in sandy grandy mm. um and and his family the hislop family um have deep roots in in toko so we went there we had a family house there we went there spent some time okay um and he was the one who convinced me go back give it another year if it mm. doesn't work out but then you know you can pursue your engineering career, go back to school, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, again, I, I, at the end of, to start that second year at Reading, um, which I was kind of thinking, look, just get through this and, and, and um, you know, figure out what life, life has, has for you after that. Um, Reading sold their goalkeeper. I was I was promoted to be the number one. They simply had no no money to buy anybody else. Mm -hmm. So I was thrown in the deep end and, and, and things worked out. Um, for a long, long story short, um, similar at, at Newcastle, I, I had challenges. I had challenges that that really made me consider um, whether 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 it was worth enduring. Um, I remember probably um, at the toughest point in, in my Newcastle career, um, my wife my wife had had our first daughter, um, born in '96, and um, she fell ill. It wasn't serious. But it was enough to have her in hospital, okay. and all of a sudden, you know, this came at a point where I, I really was questioning whether whether I wanted to continue playing football for, for a living, whether I wanted to continue um, putting myself out there as, as I had been, um, whether I could endure the abuse that that was, that was coming. Yeah. Um, and as I say, all of a sudden, having to go to training in the morning and then go straight from training to the hospital, spend the rest of the day there. Uh, it put things in perspective, um, and and all of a sudden, you know, the the trials, the tribulations, didn't matter. What people had to say um, didn't matter, and, and I think that was um, again that was another a crucial turning point in in my career, in my own in my own evolution as as a as, as a football player. Yeah. Well, to fast forward a little bit, you moved from Newcastle. Went across to West Ham, then went to Portsmouth, then came back to West Ham. Um, throughout that whole, you could say, journey throughout the the Eng in England and those English teams, which team that you played for, um, you know, has that that special place in in your heart? Well, it, it's West Ham. I went from Newcastle to West Ham in '98, and then went from West Ham to Portsmouth in, in 2002. Okay. And then um, three years at Portsmouth. Um, back to Newcastle in 2005 to 2006, which mm -hmm. of course culminated in, in the World Cup, yeah. and then and then on to, on to MLS. So I spent five years in, in total 
mm -hmm. uh, at West Ham. I played my best football at West Ham, okay. no, no question. Uh, it was the most I enjoyed my football under Harry Redknapp at, at, at West Ham, and um, I still consider I consider myself a West Ham fan. I'm very partial to, to the clubs that that I played for, and it, you can tell in my analysis of it with, with ESPN. Um, but uh, West Ham, West Ham has has he has he. Um, most dear part in, in, in my heart. Right. Interestingly enough, I mean, it's strange for Trent, usually Trinidadians like the big teams. Yeah. But as if, uh, if you track back this show a couple of weeks, one of my soft spots when I was younger was West Ham. I had no reason to like them. I actually just liked the, yeah. the uniform color and the canyo. <laughs> right. And I was like, wow. And then, well, I was young and you were there at the time. Everybody was supporting Manchester United, but I was a Hammers fan and people were like, what is that uniform you have on? I was like, right, yeah, right, that's, yeah, that's West Ham. Yeah, yeah. But it's I interesting. Was, um, mm -hmm. I think it, was, it might have been last year. Oh. I was I was on a flight and 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 somebody come and asked me. You know, a guy recognized me. and came to talk to me and um, asked me who who was support. So I told him West Ham, and he started to laugh. Mm -hmm. And it's only when he looked at me and he realized, well, I was laughing. <laughs> this man serious that he kind of his, his whole demeanor changed. Oh. It's like you know the, the attitude really or is you know. Who supports West Ham? Yeah. yeah, that type of thing. But yeah. that's my club. I know exactly how you feel. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the only person who does here. <laughs> but interestingly enough, you brought up Harry Redknapp. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 it, funny enough, that's actually it leads into our next question. Um, I mean, you were coached, as Joshua said. You know, you played for many teams. Mm -hmm. uh, who would you say was your most, you know, influence influential coach? I mean, not necessarily most, be England, but you know, most, overall. The most influential coach in, in my life was, was my St. Mary's College coach, Hayden Martin, mm -hmm. who also taught at the school. Um, I felt he, he, had, he had a big impact on me. I, I enjoyed my football at high school, playing college league as it was back then, um, secondary school football league as, as it's now known. That's the most I enjoyed football in my entire life, um, no question. I enjoyed it. Um, and. and probably why I stuck with it for, for as long as I did it. And Hayden Martin played a, a big part in that. Okay. As did Bertel Sinclair, my first coach, my first youth national team coach, who remains to this day a, a huge impact, um, a, a hugely influential man in, in my life. It wasn't always easy under Bertel. I, I say that without apology, and, and Bertel knows that. He's, mm -hmm. he's not an easy man to play for. Mm -hmm. But I, I think when you, when you like me, uh, can look back on, on on a life in the game and on, on people who have had an impact. I, I don't think you appreciate how big or how important people like Bertel are until 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 you can look way back and, and understand how how it all came together. And and, and Bertel certainly um, Bertel certainly was, was was that for me and, and still holds still holds um, a lot of respect for, for me and, and what he's given given me in terms of tools to prepare myself for for a long time in the game. Okay. So is there like a, a standing out moment in the EPL um your your stint in the EPL season that you could remember like one particular save or is there like a special game that really stands out to you within your whole time in the EPL? Uh, in, in the Premier League, um, I'm not sure. There, there's one save that I was particularly proud of. I, I, I remember quite well. I feel it's even my best um, individual moment in, okay. in, in the league. And it was a save from uh, Steve McManaman in Newcastle against Chelsea, uh, against okay. Liverpool at St. James's Park. Uh, McManaman hit one that come off Philippe Albert, I believe it was. Um, and you know, went went completely the other direction. I had to change course, mm -hmm. and and I got back to it. and was able to palm it onto the post, and then followed up and got into the rebound. It was pretty early on in, in my Newcastle career, and people okay. were still, you know, unsure of who I was or, or you know, uh, what, what I could bring to this Newcastle team. And, and I felt that kind of, um, I felt that save that save stood out and and um, kind of made people sit up and and take notice. Um, so. Talking about just individual uh, games or instances, certainly for in, in my Premier League career, that that above all. Okay. Well, there you hear it from Shaka Hislop. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. And, you know, for the second part of the interview, we're going to dive into some more local football, you know, how his experiences in the 2006 
World Cup and, and also where Shaka is right now. So this is Football 101, bringing the field to your home and we'll be right back after these messages. No matter what team you support, Manchester United strike first. You will always remember that one year when they <laughs> were invincible, Alito. unstoppable, United again, dominant, the last part of Chelsea level. And as the new season arrives, and again. you will ask yourself that one question. The best in the Champions League. Can this be our year? Horse? Seriously? Man, you? You're not even in the Champions League? So just because you have a striker that actually scoring goals now, you feel you could talk? Yes! Guys, guys, guys. This argument makes no sense because the man want to take it this way. It's unconfined. Some things are just meant to be. Okay, welcome back to Football 101 and yes, the interview is going to continue with the one and only Shaka Hislop. So, Shaka, you retired from international football in 2004 and then you got a call in 2006, I believe, about returning to the national team. What, what really made you say yes to coming back to Trinidad to, to play for us and or try to get us into the World Cup, which we actually didn't get into? Well, um, the running joke, Sydney, when I was playing with the national team was I actually retired more times than I played. <laughs> so, say I retired at one, at one year or another, I'm, I'm, you know, that, that could be anything, to, to be quite honest. Yeah. Um, but, you know, um, I, I felt the 2002 campaign was probably our best opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to qualify, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, 2002, I would have been, uh, or Shane, during the qualifying campaign, I'd have been in my early 30s. Yeah. Dwight was a couple of years younger. Russell Latham is about the same age. I felt we were all playing our best football um, at, at that time and probably had a had our strongest squad. Uh, once that kind of fell flat, you know, I felt it was time for, for somebody else um, to step up, give somebody else an opportunity. Um, but then I got a call from Bertha Sinclair, who, who I'd mentioned before, mm -hmm. and, and recently passed mm -hmm. um, Richard Braffitt, who was the national team manager, and a huge uh, influence in my life, okay. certainly in terms of a mentor, um, in terms of being a mentor to me. Okay. Um, Richard is somebody I have an immense amount of time for. So to get a call from, from either of those two, let alone both, asking me to come back um, to be a part of the squad, whether it's as a player or just um, as a team member, um, was was it, it, it was it was an easy decision. I couldn't mm -hmm. say no to either of the two of them simply because of what they meant to me, um, and 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 that's what happened. And then the campaign started. Uh, the campaigns that 2006 qualifying campaign started under those two, Richard Braffitt and, and, and Berta Sinclair. Of course, Berta was, was eventually replaced by, by Leo Benaka. Yeah. Um, so that, that's, what, that's what brought me back. In, in short, those mm -hmm. two gentlemen. Okay. Okay. Well, Shaka, I will, actually, I have a little mini story for you. Just before you guys, this will be interesting, you'll probably laugh at this. Just before the Mexico game and the qualifiers, the crucial game against Mexico that we had to win. Yeah. And the qualifiers. I was in Port of Spain buying doubles. Right. I saw two tall gentlemen walking on the road, yourself and Clayton Ince, I believe. Yes, it was Clayton Ince. This was the okay. day before the game. So back then, you didn't have cell phones, you didn't have no selfie. You can't run and take a selfie and things like that. Right. So I, you know, being a football junkie, I was like, oh goodness, I just jump out the car I was in. And you guys were walking towards the hotel, I think it was Crown Plaza at the time. Yeah. And you guys are caught up, and I was, uh, then when I finally, while I catching my breath, I was like, ah, okay, guys. And then I actually, I actually froze. I didn't know what I was going to even ask you guys. <laughs> so then I was like, ah, all right, all right. So then um, I didn't, back then autographs was a big thing. Right. I literally had nothing. So you guys signed my t-shirt 
Okay, okay. And uh, I told you guys, well, good luck in the game tomorrow, stuff like that. And you all, you was like, all right, thanks, brother. <laughs> <laughs> you, all, you sound all macho and ready for the game. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, uh, one yes. of the, I had, like, for a fan, you know, that was exciting for me. It would be funny if you didn't remember that, but no, you didn't. But <laughs> no, and, uh, yeah, I, I know, I know. Individual thing. But I mean, yeah. I, as players, it was an exciting time for us as well. Yeah. But, um, well, basically, I just wanted to give you a recap. But another question is, you know, like many fans, we, I mean, people love football. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, that all over the world, fans yeah. can only speculate. I mean, we wonder what it's like to step out, you know, on the biggest stage of the game, like the World Cup. Qualifying for the World Cup, you made history for Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Lots of big players didn't make it to that stage. You know, a good example yeah. is Ryan Giggs. You know, you know, what was it like to have such an honor and, you know, experience that atmosphere? Yeah. I, I, like I said before, you know, I, I, a lot of what I, what I do mm. felt like a fairy tale, you know, I mean, I, I'm no different from any other fan. Um, uh, you, you, you see these things or you, you grow up kind of, you know, imagining yourself or, or putting yourself in situations that you see on, on television and, and, you know, calling your name alongside the likes of you know, junior or Socrates or, or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was no different in, in that regard. And to have it happen to me, see, it, it seems surreal, you know, it seems surreal. As much as you were immersed in it and you, you had a job to do, you know, especially now, um, at the stage I, I, I'm at now, you look back on it and, and it seems surreal. I remember, I, and I wish I'd read this book earlier on in my, in my own professional footballing life. It was, I can't remember the name of the book. I think it was something like Keep at the Gate or some of sort. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a, written by a goalkeeper from Barnsley, who played for Barnsley. I think he was Dutch. But he was talking about his approach and enjoying the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the parallel he drew was with Oliver Kahn. Um, and, you know, talk about Oliver Kahn's focus and, and why, how everybody talks about Oliver Kahn and his focus and, uh, you know, why, why that was so good for him and his career. And his whole opinion was, why play this long, why stay this long in the game? Why accomplish as much as you do? Why win as much as, as you do? And not be able to tell, be so focused that you have no idea mm -hmm. or you don't fully appreciate the moment. And that was his thing. Mm -hmm. He would always go onto the field, he would listen to the crowd, he would see if he could smell the hamburgers or the hot dogs. He would be aware of birds were flying overhead, he would be aware of, of, uh, of what music was playing on the, on, on the tannoy. He would immerse himself in the moment. And that's something I started to do the last three or four years of my life. And start thinking, hold on, this is something that not many people experience. Let me, let me soak it all in. Let me, let me be right in the middle of it and it's, it's something I started to do and, and I would start what I started was coming out earlier and earlier for, for warm-ups um, and as much as you know you have to start focusing the time for games I wanted mm -hmm. to be I wanted to be more aware of the crowd how it was building out I wanted to be more aware and appreciate what I was doing because I felt too much of, of my career I was just focused on getting the right result or getting the best out of myself I wanted to be I wanted to be more aware more immersed in, in what I was doing and, and that um, and, and I felt that, that that helped me a lot particularly in the latter years of my career because of course once you get older you know your reflexes start to slow down you can't do the things that, that you once did but I was still able to appreciate being there whether it's sitting on the bench or being out in the field I was always fully appreciative of um of what I was doing. Yeah, I mean, I could tell you, I mean, you're fully, just listen to your story, you know, my paws ra being raised because I'm, <laughs> I was so insanely into those games, especially that Sweden game. Yeah. I mean, I know you weren't initially set to start. <laughs> That's how much I followed the team. I was, I, I thought Jack was supposed to start. And then I, 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 I wrote down my little team list. And then, well, you, uh, Shaka came on and said, all right, well, I guess Shaka is on. <laughs> and then, well, I mean, with Avery John gone and you all had a monster of a game. You had some point black saves that were, I mean, they were ridiculous. I was in front of the TV, shouting my lungs out. So it I mean, was fun. it was. I mean, I mean, I think things work out. Things, 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 things worked out. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, Kevin Jack was scheduled to play, mm -hmm. um, and which worked. I feel worked for me in, mm -hmm. in the way things panned out. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I have 
I, I always get nervous before I play, mm. uh, which is not a problem. I feel I feel I've been able to channel that nervous energy to my benefit. Um, but you know, on this bigger stage, that bigger occasion, not having my name down to play meant I didn't bother. You know, I had a great night's sleep. You know, mm. I was nervous and tossing and turning and thinking about anything else. Yeah. I woke up. I woke up the morning the game, had a big breakfast that probably I wouldn't have and <laughs> enjoyed it and relaxed and had a fully relaxing day all day building up to the game. I wasn't concerned about about Sweden, I wasn't concerned about it being the World Cup. My my whole approach was I'm 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 a fan first and foremost, which which I'd always been. Um, and I just had a really good seat. Or a bit on the sidelines and, and that was the approach. And all of a sudden Again, you get thrown in at the deep end and, and um, sink or swim time. And, and you know, after after 14 years of, of, of in the game, you know, I've had my sink or swim moments and, and now just another one. Oh yeah, and you, you rose to the occasion in that one. Yeah. Well, a lot, of, a lot of people know Shaka Hislop, the player, you know, from just, you know, the, the uh, casual fan. Mm -hmm. But many people don't know about some of your causes that you're involved in off the field. I was uh, one of the, um, I am a huge follower when you uh, started your show racism, the Red Guard initiative. Mm -hmm. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was necessary. I thought people, you know, uh, you know, of, you know, certain ethnicities needed something like that. It was present in football. Yeah. Um, I understood from that you also had an experience which led to this. But um, tell us a little bit about the, uh, how the show racism, the Red Guard uh, initiative got started. Uh primary experience that uh, motivated me to, to get involved with this mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't my own it was in, in fact my father's mm -hmm. I mentioned uh, I mentioned my father and going to law school in London um, he'd been racially racially harassed and actually wrongfully arrested mm -hmm. um, this would have been in, in the mid 60s oh yeah um, that time uh, and, and well, from it he he him and, and, and his, his lifelong friend Desmond Allam, who was already in law school, they sued the Metropolitan Police. He took the money and, and um, went to Trinidad for a six week holiday, which is where he met and, and proposed to my mother in six weeks and then enrolled in law school himself. So that kind of was the, the primary motivator um, to what I was doing. Just after I joined Newcastle, I was contacted by, by this group, um, uh, Youth Against Racism in Europe, I think is how, how, well, how, they, um, well, how they were called at the time, about some of their work. And, and I wrote to them expressing support and offering to help however I can. That followed up with a meeting be between, uh, between myself, Jed, Gre Jed Grebby, who is who's still uh, the CEO of Showrace and the Red Card, and Kevin, I can't remember Kevin's surname right, right now, um, about how we can build, this, build out this initiative and better impact our community, um, the, the community in the Northeast. Which meant, you know, my traveling around the Northeast, speaking at schools, I would get other players involved. Um, and it, it just it just grew from there. Um, you know, a, a lot more players got involved uh, as I as I, as I approached them to it, um, and we went from you know me me and uh, driving around schools in, in Newcastle to at one point I think we had eight different chapters throughout Europe, um, wow. over a thousand footballers uh, acting as, as ambassadors themselves. Mm -hmm. So I look I look at that, and I'm still the honorary president of Shoreys on the Red Card. I look at that. A sense of paternal pride, because I, I, as, as, as you say, Andre, I felt was needed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, too often we kind of accept, or we, we're able to dismiss where we are um, in in terms of progress by saying, "Well, look at how things were ten years ago," and, and I think that is as damaging to to our own to our own progress, our own evolution to the game, mm -hmm. um, and what it should stand for as just plain out blatant racism. Yeah. We can't sit back on, on our laws and accept that. You know, this, this game has to be all inclusive, and that and that uh, was was our underlying motivation, um, in in and remains to be in, in in this initiative. Well, you definitely achieve your objective because um, several years ago, based on the influence that initiative had on me, I hosted an event. I mean, it was all of turned out, of course, but it was of small scale with minimal budget. But the entire theme was based around your initiative, mm -hmm. show racism, the red card. 
I didn't know you then. I sort of asked you to, I don't know, maybe do some a cameo, which you couldn't do as on <laughs> Skype. But uh, it, it, it's, I love it. I think it's genius. I think it's absolutely necessary. I try to push it as much as I can. Um, I, I think I ordered a couple of the t-shirts. I walk around with my show racism, the Red Guard t-shirts. That's great. And, Chris, um, thank you very much. Yes. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, hope, and I, 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 I hope it catches on because I love it. And I, I encourage my footballers to look up on it as well. So in addition to the, you know, the player, the, you know, the, the, the social, socially aware shaka, now you have become, you know, the analyst at ESPN. <laughs> so how did that transition take place? Well, it, it's, again, this is a strange one. I, uh, I finished my career at, at, at FC Dallas and retired before the end of the season um, in, in 2007. I think it would have been in September I retired. I, I probably would have retired at the end of the season anyway. Um, but I had a back injury that I just couldn't shake. So I decided to, to call it quits before the end of the season. I allowed Dallas to bring somebody else in, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, you know, retiring early had its benefits because it was calm, you know, it, it, it got mentioned in the press as opposed to if it was done in the off season, I think it would have largely gone unnoticed. Um, the main producer, the coordinator producer at Press Pass, as, as it was in the time, um, a guy called Steve Polisi, he been aware of, of, of me throughout my career, knew what I did professionally. He'd seen me do a number of interviews. I was always impressed with the way I handled myself and and, um, and, and I can express an opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, and he got um, he got a he, he got my contact details, gave me a call, asked me to come up and, and do a couple of shows with them. I mean, I just retired. I, I had nothing else to do. Um, <laughs> My wife, who's also from Trinidad, my wife and I were, were planning to, or getting ready to, to move back to, move back to Trinidad, probably, you know, over the, over the Christmas or early, early in the year, in the new year. Um, and then, you know, so I went up, like, okay, fine, I'll come up, we we'll do a couple of shows, which is exactly what I did. And, and they followed up about a week or two later and, and said, you know, they were happy with, really happy with how things went, how I handled myself. Uh, on camera with my relationship with the other guys who, who were on set. At the time, it was Tommy Smith, Janusz Michalik, and Derek Ray, and, and offered me a, perf- uh, a permanent position from there. I'd never planned to do television. I'd never planned to be an, an analyst. I'd never done any courses to it. It's not something I'd ever given any thought to, but again, you know, you're given an opportunity and it's sink or swim time. You mm-hmm. know, it's what I'd, what I'd done continually for, for 15 years previous. And, um, and it worked out. Yeah, well, you work with, with a, a great group of guys. I mean, this show actually evolved out of watching Press Pass back in the day with you and with Tommy Smith and, and all the guys. And now you have a new group of people with, um, you know, Alejandro Moreno, Craig Burley. Um, what's it like we're working with these guys? I mean, you all seem to know everything and anything about each player and you know, it's really insightful. So what's it like, how the show has evolved to where it is right now? Well, the show evolved, I mean, um, when, I, when I first joined back in, back in 2008, um, the show we did, we were going two days a week. Um, the show now, as, as I said, it was press file back then, the show ESPN FC, is now six days a week, and mm-hmm. as, as as you rightly point out, you know some of the some of the talent, some of the on air talent, um, has changed. Um, but largely, it's it's pretty much the same thing. We we do what we do. We follow the game as much as you can. Um, there's also a, a sense of uh, of, of sharing uh, within the group. I mean, we can't all sit and watch every single game. Um, you know, to to have an opinion on every single game. So we try to to split up responsibilities, we share notes, etc. So, you know, you know what games or you know, you, you have a, a, a good a, a good feeling for for what happened or who was good or who was bad and, mm-hmm. and we have a lot of discussions off air about those things. You know, sometimes not too in depth because you like to have a more realistic and honest opinion and reaction mm-hmm. on air. Yeah. So we discuss things but just generally, and we more get into depth when when, when we go on air. Yeah. So as, aside from that, it's you know it's it's uh, there's no real change, and you know as much as I see the talent is the talent the talent has has changed. Um, I feel 
I feel what drives the show and, and, and that particular the people behind the scenes haven't and, and that, that is as, as big as a reason as, as, as why the transition has been as seamless as, as it has. But one thing I really have to ask though, <laughs> considering Craig Burley, is his tattoo of Fernando Torres real or is it a fake tattoo? <laughs> I'm, I'm not at liberty to read. <laughs> <laughs> we were going to throw that curveball at you and see what you would say. A very diplomatic answer. Yes, yes, very diplomatic. Uh, well, basically, you know, I mean, uh, just, you know, following up on what Joshua said, mm -hmm. I mean, we know you have nice chemistry with all the hosts, but people seem to talk about a lot between you and Tommy. You know, yeah. if for some reason, this is just a hypothetical question we came up with, some reason you couldn't make it today. If you had to choose one guy to represent you, who would it be? <laughs> um, I'm not sure I'll choose either actually. <laughs> I'd probably just I'd be, it'd probably just be a blank screen right behind me at, at this point. Tommy Smith is hood right now. I, I, think, I think the reason why Tommy and I and similarly Craig and I uh -huh. um, work so well on TV is because we we, we are polar opposites. Yeah. You know, um uh you know, particularly Tommy who is is a fan, you know, mm. through and through. He, he he's a fan. Um, and his opinions, you know, originate from him just uh, being passionate about what he sees and understanding what he sees. Craig, on the other hand, well, was a player, as, as you know, but he, he has a, a different opinion to me, a, um, a totally different outlook to me as, as to you know, a lot of aspects of the game. Mm -hmm. But again, um, our opposing views is probably why, why our relationships work as well on air. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, like a, a perfect example of that is when you all go at each other with the power rankings. I yeah. see they give you a hard time for that. <laughs> <laughs> they always give me a hard time for my power rankings. Yeah, always. yeah, yeah. Moreno and those guys, you know. I see everyone they question you. Shaka, what is this? I, I would yeah, do a Tommy yeah. Smith voice, but I'm not going to do it. Yeah. It's a terrible impersonation of Tommy. I don't want him coming down here and, you know, hmm. taking me out. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you've come a long way, you know, from a student who played. And uh, football in Trinidad, you know, the usual guy, you know, just like anybody else, to a professional player. What do you attribute, you know, to, I mean, there's probably that one quality you could attribute to your success and growth as a player, you know, and well, what is the main quality you would, you would say, or you would give to people to tell, you know? The main quality is I'm willing to take on any challenge mm -hmm. and I don't let failure hamper or the fear of failure. Um, get in the way of, of my taking on that challenge. Mm. I've, I've failed more than most, but I've got up, dust myself off and carried on more than most. Yeah, I, I believe, you know, you can't taste success unless you really had a couple of failures. It doesn't, it doesn't have the same impact. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, Absolutely. in terms of, you, you're currently an analyst, what plans do you have for the future? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, and, and that, you know, that kind of evolves. And I'm, I mean, some of the things I'm involved with, I'm not sure where, where it will take me. Um, yes, my, my 9 to 5, as, as I say, is, is with ESPN as an analyst. Um, I continue to be involved in the game, you know, either at the CONCACAF level and some of the discussions, some of the plans that they're having. Um, as you may or may not know, I'm, I'm also part of the IFAB board um, in terms of uh, well, one of the advisory panels anyway, mm -hmm. um, in terms of um, the, the laws of the game and, and how how the game itself is, is evolving and those opportunities that you know I, I thoroughly enjoy mm -hmm. they aren't paid opportunities they're entirely voluntary at, at this point but you know it's getting me involved um, in the game at a level that, that I'd love to I'd love to be able to do um, on a more permanent basis so, so, but for the, for the time being again this is not something I've ever planned to do not um, not positions that I ever planned to hold they came about and and um and and I'm, in, and I'm enjoying the opportunity to have an impact in in, in the game um in, in in this capacity well before you know we we let shaka go we know he's a busy man we just have a, one more question we can um, probably ask him if there was one thing that you could have done differently in your entire career would what, what would that be wow um Work for Football 101. Yeah, other than Work for Football yeah, that, that, That's a good question. I'm, I'm really not sure. Um, I mean, there's a lot of things that I've 
uh, I guess I, I couldn't maybe should have done differently. But you know, at the end of the day, I look back on 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 a fifteen year career. Yeah. Um, ten of those fifteen years I spent in the Premier League. I represented Trinidad and Tobago at the World Cup. Um, there's not a whole lot else I could have asked out of my career when I when I first started. I, I, I know that for anything worthwhile, it, it would never be smooth sailing. Um, so you take it for what it is. I'm, I'm very happy with what, I, what I've accomplished. Um, yes, I've made mistakes along the way, but that's that's part of the landscape. Um, I'm not changing anything. Okay, great. Well, um, for the last question, actually, we sent out um, that we knew that Shaq was going to be on Football 101. So we sent it out to the viewers, and the viewers sent back some questions. So we have one question that we just want to ask. It's from Sharad Mohammed, and he asks, Italian football has been in a serious decline since 2012. What has yeah. attributed to this great league decline? Well, a number of things. I think the game... Uh as, as a spectator sport has, has evolved. Yeah. Um, the, the beauty of the beauty of Italian football is is in the um, tactical nuances of, of different teams. Um, and and largely, you know, we you are all of a sudden talking mass consumption of, of football uh, on television. And not everybody appreciates, you know, a, a, a tactical one nil. Um, you know, I, 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 I think the beauty of English football is that it's all, you know, it's all peace, it's all excitement, mm -hmm. um, it's all drama, um, which which is what attracts the, the large audiences. And, and I know for a fact, um, for instance, I've, I've spent a lot of time discussing the, the English Premier League with people who run the English Premier League. They monitor things like fouls and cards and how much time the ball stays in play and how that translates to the goals and spectator numbers. So they, they have this down to a science, which which is why I think the English Premier League stands, stands above and, and, and beyond everybody else. I mean, there are other contributing factors um, to the decline of Italian football. I think only Juventus mm -hmm. own their own, own stadium out and out, and that's that's only been over the last, what, three or four years. And so that... That um, the, the revenues you get from from your own stadium or controlling the, the cameras or, or whatever it may be is also hampering to everybody else in Italian football, um, and and that has that has also um, has also had uh, had played a part in this decline. Okay. Well, Shaka, we just want to thank you for you know spending this time with us. I know you're a busy man, and we really appreciate you you know giving football. One on one, the time that this it was supposed to be a half an hour interview is going into an hour, but we really, really, we really do thank you for it. One last question I, I believe I asked you this question when we met in the fan club two years ago. Hmm. I want to see if it changed from the answer I got back then. <laughs> Out of all the teams that you played for, I know if I ask you what team you support, I know you're gonna say either West Ham, Portsmouth, or Reading, but other than the teams you've played for, what team do you really? that you could say that you really like their style and that you would support them if you didn't play for those other teams in the EPL? A team that I didn't play for and I like their style? And that's, a, that's an easy answer. And I hope it's the same answer I gave you a few years ago. <laughs> Arsenal. Um, I like what Arsene Wenger does, does with Arsenal Football Club. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their successes or, or their, the, um, the club isn't based around... Um, Irresponsible spending. They have to, you know, as much as, as, as they say, you know, they, they have money to spend. Mm -hmm. Arsene Wenger believes in, in a certain approach, and that is growing Arsenal Football Club as as a standalone business. Um, you know, I don't mean this as, as any disrespect to, to any other clubs or their approaches or how they're financed or their ownership. But you know, a lot of a lot of clubs are heavily in debt to their yeah. current owners. Yeah. And my question is. When those current owners become bored uh, mm -hmm. with, with the football club, what next? Where yeah. do they go next? Yeah. Um, whereas Arsenal, you know, they grow themselves as a business, as a profitable business. I, I feel that's the best long-term approach for a football club. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're just mortgaging your futures. Um, that combined with, with their style of play uh, makes me a, a huge, a huge Arsenal and Arsenal Wenger fan. In that regard. Okay. 
Lashley well, last two years you actually said Barcelona was the one shy team that you know support. But I, I I think back then that was when, you know, even that Barcelona was still playing good football. That was when they were at their peak, you know, with the Champions League and everything. Well, well, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Barcelona. I, I mm-hmm. A couple of things have changed for Barcelona with me. Yeah. Um, you know, came as a club, bigger than a club, mm-hmm. which, which, you know, um, you know, they have in their stands mm-hmm. and was the underlying driving principle for Barcelona Football Club mm-hmm. has changed. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they never had shared sponsorship. Yeah, um, then that is they, very true. They went from Qatar Foundation to, uh, which was supposed to be a charitable event, to Qatar Airways, I believe it is now. And I think that kind of took away from from the meaning of, of more than a club for, for uh, more than a club mm-hmm. for Barcelona for me. Um, but still, you know, um, I, I, I I do admire what what Barca are doing. I do admire the players that they have. Mm-hmm. Um, that that hasn't changed a whole lot. I know you really wanted to say Central FC, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. That's all right. I understand, Joshua. Put you on. I'm not needing my colors to any mass in Intra. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a Central FC fan, um, or, pri- or primarily through through Brent Sancho, yeah. but also have a very good relationship with, with David John Williams and mm-hmm. the connection. I like what he's doing with that club down there. Um, so I can't say that. Um, I can't say that, that I'm a fan of, of one more than the other, Sydney, in, in, in respect to those two. Once again, very diplomatic answer. I like yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. You know, Shaka, um, congratulations on your, I mean, you mentioned that we were going to ask you a question, but you popped up, you, you, you touched on it already with the, uh, if I'm pronouncing it properly, is it, the, is it IFAB or IFAB panel? The FIFA? Yeah, I, I, IFAB. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, uh, well, I was going to tell you congratulations, but you brought it up. So congrats to that. Um, congrats on representing the country at uh, you know such a you know a prestigious football career, mm-hmm. and also you know a very respectable field as an analyst. Yep. Um, inspiring people such as myself who wants to be in that area, mm-hmm. and you know it's, a, it's always a pleasure having you. Even I wasn't here the first time. <laughs> it's good to have you back again. And Thank thanks for much. taking time out of your busy schedule to answer our questions. Mm-hmm. And we hope to see you again. I'm sure you will. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, well, this is Football 101. I'm your host, Joshua Dematos. This is Andre Soklal. And this is Football 101. Bringing the field to your home. <laughs>